uh, working with Parquet. So when we uh, sorted data in column on five formats, when users query large white tables, uh, but only uh, uh, query a subset of those, you only read from the disk only the part that is needed by the query. If you store them in traditional RDBMS row by row format, you need to read the entire row and then throw away the other parts that you don't need and just give the users the entire key with that data. So it was a huge saving in terms of storage cost as well as the query compute side uh, to, to have the stuff uh, stored in like column or file format. And it's a current, I think it's a basically a standard these days to store the big data in parquet or some sort of column or file formats. And the ETL, again, as I said, all the transformation was happening in Hadoop in a scalable fashion. We uh, provide different query engines to different users based on the need. We had a uh, Hive, uh, Presto uh, as like basic interactive uh, query engines. Uh, we provide notebooks for our uh, data scientists. We give programmatic access to Spark with this data. So we basically decouple the storage of this data and ingestion from the query layer. So users have flexibility to pick their own uh, solution based on their needs. Uh, and we, at the, in early days, we took a, a subset of our data sets into traditional warehousing solution. That was optimized for our city operator because it was pretty fast and uh, it was basically for recent data that you can fit in there, it was working pretty well. Uh, the problem with that is like we are, again, as our data grew in size, we moved from, again, those warehousing tools again, are usually in order of 100 terabytes when our data quickly get into ten, tens of petabytes. So it didn't scale that well. So we were storing only the past few weeks of data based on the city operator. So it was great for those use cases, but not for our data scientists that want to run a query across like the past three years of data. Uh, so this solution allowed us to basically store a few tens of petabytes uh, and provide a data latency of 24 hours. Uh, so, okay, the big wins we had, it was the first time that we had all our data in one place. So it was a game changer for the company. And uh, we, uh, we had all the, the modeling, the, the transformation and data modeling, the ETL happening in a scalable fashion in a most efficient way. We were doing it in a batch mode that was very efficient. And users were very happy because we had different uh, type of query engines for them and they could pick the, the one that works best for their use case. But going back to the problems. Uh, so the main problems we faced was, okay, this becomes very popular. So we had more and more use, uh, users start using this data. That becomes, they required more data sets, more pipelines to bring this data in, as well as more users to query this data. So scalability starts showing up. Uh, the, the scalability we faced were particularly with uh, HDFS. So HDFS is scalable out of the box into let's say 10 petabytes with some config adjustment and tuning, you can get it into 20, 30 bytes of data, but that's the limit. Beyond that, you're gonna see all the limitations of HDFS. Again, if you have too many small files, if you don't have large files, you're gonna see that earlier. If you do optimize for all those stuff, main note at some point is gonna be the, the bottleneck in HDFS. Same thing with our data pipelines. So we started having data pipelines bringing these tables into Hadoop. So we initially had tens of them, it becomes quickly hundreds of them, and then we had tens of thousands of these pipelines. And since we, we, we were basically in early days, we were inferring the schema on the fly when we were ingesting the data, we had like tens of people just working on this pipeline because every time there was an upstream change, one of these pipelines were failing. And so that's the, we had uh, problems in scaling the number of pipelines and how to uh, keep it manageable. The second issue we faced was with the data latency, which was 24 hours. We basically were making a snapshot of the tables at the source and bringing it into Hadoop. And that requires basically to convert it into Parquet. It, required, it, it was taking 24 hours. That was very slow for our business. The other problems we were facing was with the updates and late arriving data. Uh, we were storing the data in uh, Hadoop, which is mostly append only, and we were using Parquet, which is an immutable file format. So if the request gets updated or arrives late, you can't go and update it in that one. So that was another issue we were having. And finally, since our source tables were, were, were brought in in a, a snapshot base, basically you make a snapshot, bring it in, swap the two tables, the ETL has to be in a snapshot fashion and take the new tables and regenerate the whole tables. That was also taking a few hours. So we had 24 hours for the raw data to be delivered, plus several hours for the, for, for the model tables to get updated. And that was basically for our business, which is a real time by nature. This was very slow. Okay. 
So let's spend a few minutes talking about all, all these problems. So one issue I mentioned is like uh, the, the updates that we were dealing with. So think about our trip data sets. Uh, so we have the trip data sets stored at the source, but in like some sort of sharded uh, databases or some key value that's shared based on the key. And so that's the transactional data store. So it's easy for them to add these trips and all this the new information. Uh, so when we bring the data into Hadoop, we partition the data on day level. So we have daily partition for the data arriving. So for new trips, which is, I don't know if you see the colors, but the green ones, it's pretty straightforward. So when new trips happen, you bring it into Hadoop, it's a new trip, you go and add it to the current day. The problem happens when a trip gets updated. And this can happen because of the nature of the business. When you take an Uber uh, and then basically you, you may have some dispute about the fares. So you may send a support to get that, okay, the driver, and then we'll stick around the city of overcharge. They look at the history and your trip maps and they adjust. So the trip may be $15 initially. After you submit a request, it may go down to $5. So now you have an update on an existing trip. And this can happen multiple times. The driver may, for example, complain and say, okay, you make him stay, like wait for like 10 minutes before you show up, so they adjust it back to 10 minutes. So now you have a few updates on the fare of the trips. Usually the trip's fare gets adjusted only in the, in the next few days that you do that. So it has some temporal history uh, between a few days from the time it happens. But we also have other types of updates. For example, you rate your driver uh, next time that you take an Uber. Uh, I'm pretty sure no one in this room is taking Uber uh, on, like, basically, hopefully you're taking Uber on daily basis. So you do it within a very recent days and you update your, your rate your driver, which makes life easier for us. But if you're not taking Uber on daily basis and you're doing it, for example, let's say every week or every month, you may rate a trip from the past month, the past two months even. So you have an update on older trips. And again, this is like some sort of updates. We had other business use cases, for example, they have to do I don't know, tax compliance at the end of the year. So they need to adjust some stuff based on those. So these updates were basically after a while, you notice that it's not a one-off thing. So we initially were trying to hide it under the rock and just find a work Crown, but then we saw that it's natural part of a data set that we need to think about and fundamentally so. Uh, so why did the latency stay at 24 hours? Uh, so basically, as I said, we were making a snapshot of the source table uh, and we make a snapshot uh, and we put it in H space to absorb all the update, updates in one shot. We make a snapshot from up around H space every few hours and we convert that into parquet. Initially, when we started with this model, uh, it was pretty fast that our chips data set we converted into Parquet, a new snapshot into Parquet. We swapped the two tables every few hours. But then our data set starts growing. And we reached a point that basically we had our job, we had like a few hundreds of terabytes of source data, and it was taking our jobs, a spark job with a thousand executors, like around 20 hours to convert that data to Parquet. And if you think about it, it's not that just the 20 hours that you need to spend on that. It's actually a lot of inefficiency involved because you have a trip table, it's let's say 100 terabytes, and you have 100 gigabytes of that new trips or updated trips every day. And because of 100 gigabytes of updates or new trips, you are reconverting 100 terabytes of data into a column of file format which was not an efficient use of our resources. And again, it didn't let us to reduce our data latency beyond 24 hours because that was the time it takes to basically convert the data. Okay, now that we understood the problems, let's start looking at how we tackle those. Let's go over each of the problems I mentioned one by one and see how we tackle those. So the first thing was scalability issue. And I said HDFS is one of the issues we face when we, our data starts going between beyond 40, 50 petabytes of data. Uh, so again, this is a very uh, common problem for the companies that have data growing in HDFS. Uh, I'll skip some of the details because uh, again, it's, it, it's, it's hard to make it happen, but it's a straightforward. Many companies have talked about this and we have a detailed blog post talking about basically how we tackle that. Long story short, the way we do it, you have to start federating your cluster. Either you do it on the cluster, the client side, or on the basically a, a, a router to basically route the request to different cluster. But by some sort of federation, you can scale the uh, clusters to get to beyond 100 petabytes. Uh, and uh, okay, so the next uh, problem we had was with the scaling or ingestion platform. As I said, we start with tens of pipelines, we get to hundreds and we get to thousands of them. It was not easy to manage them, especially because we started writing this pipeline in Spark and then we had a source to sync specific pipelines. So every specific source, we had to write something like new codes. 
and it was not scalable when you were operating. And these pipelines were very thin, again, sometimes the volume was low, sometimes the volume was high, and these were generating different variable size of files, which is also causing a lot of problems. So the way we tackled the, 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 the data pipeline issue is we, this is the area that we looked into open source existing technology, and there were way too many of them. And, but when we start looking into those, none of them was generic enough to, so, to solve our problems. So we had to introduce our own. Uh, it's a project called Armory, and it's basically, it's an open source project. Uh, it's a generic ingestion or dispersal. Ingestion means the platform that brings the data into Hadoop. Dispersal is when you want to get your derived data set out of Hadoop into I don't know, AWS, or online data store, Cassandra cluster, somewhere out of Hadoop. So it basically works in a generic way that you have a source connector and a sync connector, and you can add a bunch of converter in between. And it basically treats all different sources of data uh, in the same fashion, regardless of where it's coming from. So using that, you are able to merge all our uh, data pipelines and different services into one platform that was connected, able to connect to Kafka, Cassandra, or uh, key value data stores and other places, both to bring the data into Hadoop as well as to get the data, the derived data sets out of Hadoop. Uh, and it's open source if you want to give it a talk. And we also have, again, a, a multiple uh, videos uh, talking about the internals on YouTube, or you can basically read a blog post that I put the link in the service. So this is a high level architecture. I skip the details to go over other materials. But basically, we have a source connector, we have a C connector, we have a standard way of managing the metadata, we have a standard way of basically filtering out the bad data, and everything is basically a bunch of convertibles that converters that you can define the logic based on what you want to achieve. Uh, as part of this effort, one thing we did was we started looking on how users use our raw data sets. We looked at other query patterns for, from the user size, and we were able to identify two patterns of use cases for the users. If you think about the problems we are having, there is a transactional upstream table, uh, like in MySQL or like March or Cassandra or something like that. So that supports updates. So you have, uh, we can look at, a lot of uh, so uh, if you look at the source, for example, this is the data online data stores. It's a transactional, so you put row one, column one, value A, row two, column two, value B, row one, column two becomes value C, and row one, column one becomes value D. If you look at this table, the logical view in data stores, this is what you have. You add one row, row one, it becomes column one, A, B, and then C and D. When you bring this into Hadoop, you get a seam of uh, these change logs, right? This is like the basically read the right head logs. And we use those to replicate these tables in Hadoop. Right? And when you bring this into Hadoop, we saw that the users need two view on the data sets, two different versions of the tables. One we call change log history table, which basically it shows the history of changes of these tables. So sometimes you want to see, for example, a driver who were waiting for a ride, then was going to pick up the passenger, then the passenger is in the ride, and then it's basically driving the passenger going to the next ride. So you want to see the intermediate trans uh, uh, the the transitions, the state that are changes. So you care about the, the intermediate changes. And that is what we call change log history table. Sometimes you want you only care about the, the latest the final value. What's the latest like fare for a trip? I don't care how many times it was disputed, what's the latest value? And that is what we call merge snapshot table. So you have a bunch of partial change logs coming in. You create a change log history, which is a sparse table because you have only update the change data values there, and you merge all this data into a merge snapshot view to keep the, the latest snapshot of these upstream tables to the users. And this is the two tables that we standardize in our big data platform uh, on the raw data sets for all the users to rely on. So let's go over the other topics. So HCFS scalability federation. Uh, the ingestion platform scalability, the generic solution. And the other problems we had was we basically, uh, we had a snapshot based ingestion that was basically taking 24 hours for the data to get refreshed. That was way too slow our business. Our business is very real time. But think about, for example, the, the promotion that one city is rolling up. Think about you're operating in San Francisco and you look at the past two or three weeks of data, you decide on a promotion, correct? You say, I'll give, I don't know, $10 to every person who takes 10, bikes, 10 trips per week. This is an out of money. So the normal transactions are pretty straightforward. There is an incoming money, which you take your commission and you pay the driver. The promotion is very tricky because it's out of pocket money. 
So you start running it, let's say, on Monday morning, and it's a very competitive environment. So you can expect the other competitors start matching that. So the winner is the company who can look at how that promotion is affecting the business and quickly go and adjust it if it's not working before you spend the money. In our previous model, we had to wait to 24 hours to 30 hours for the data to start showing up. They need to run a few hours of query to analyze that. So by the time you know whether your promotion is working or not, it was already two days of money spent on that. Right? This is why the business was having a lot of pressure on us to basically make the data more real time because it was required by the nature of the business. And the other pain points that we had was these updates and deletes. I explained why the trips or other data sets gets updated. So initially we were trying to bypass those. Again, we have to keep up data sets in common modified formats of parquet because that gives us the best storage cost as well as the best the compute cost, the lowest square the compute cost. But it was basically immutable data sets. So we had to find a solution around that. And finally, when our tables were basically a snapshot, ETL and model tables were also becoming snapshots because they have to regenerate the whole data set. It was inefficient and very slow. So when we were thinking about how we can make our raw data sets incrementally updated, uh, we also at the same time were thinking about how we can make the derived tables also updated incrementally mm -hmm. rather than being regenerated every time. So the way we tackle these problems is uh, we build a project called Hudi. Uh, it's an open source project accepted into Apache. Uh, if you want to give it a try, it's already uh, uh, embedded inside the EMR images, so you can just try it on AWS too. Uh, so the Hoodie stands for Hadoop Upserts and Incrementals. Basically, Hoodie is an abstraction layer on top of the storage, specifically on top of HDFS, append only file system, as well as the columnar file formats like Parquet. Uh, what it provides is it provides with two primitives. One is on the writer side, you have immutable file format, it gives you a notion, a primitive to update the data. So you have a append only uh, file system with immutable file format, who lets you update that. On the reader side, it provides a new functionality called incremental group. Uh, this is very uh, interesting because this was a new use case for us too. So think about um, trips data sets. We have, as I said, we partition the data on daily basis. So you have six years of data, treats data, partition on daily basis. And now we are dealing with the updates, right? So you may have a treats updated from six months ago, or one year ago for any business use case, right? For the users who are querying these tables, think about how they're gonna know that the treats from one year ago or six months ago is updated. The, the only way they can do it in normal situation is they do a full table scan and they query based, basically the filter out based on some notion of that. If all our users want to query the whole table and filter out based on notion of time, that becomes super expensive because you have, you're scanning all your data sets over and over every time. The way we tackle that in Hoodie is Hoodie provides a functionality called incremental pool, which basically you have a checkpoint on, as, on the reader side, you give it a checkpoint and it returns you all the trips, all the records that are new or updated since that checkpoint, that time stuff. And we don't need to do a full table scan. So it gives you a stream of changed or updated data since the last time you ran your query. This is an amazing functionality if you have like these ETL jobs running every one hour, every half an hour to update your direct data sets. You don't need to worry about like missing some of the previous data. You can just fetch those as a stream of data and update your, um, for your, your, your direct data set. In addition to that, Hoodie behind the scene takes care of the layout of your files on HDFS. Again, HDFS uses the notion of block size. We want to have the largest block size possible, and we don't want to use the block space. Hoodie takes care of aligning the amount of data in each file with the block size to make sure you get large files. At the same time, we don't waste any space in that. Uh, also, uh, for those of you who are familiar with like basically uh, databases, Hoodie provides the MVCC functionality, multi-version uh, concurrency control. So you can have a notion of transactions so when you run a query, you can decide on one snap, what snapshot, what version of the data you want to run against. It gives you multiple versions of the data, so you can compare this. Uh, it's a Spark-based library, so it's horizontally scalable. And the good thing is it doesn't have any other dependency other than HDFS, so it only relies on your file system to update. And again, I put the links to the blog post if you want to learn more about that. But using Hoodie, uh, the, when the data comes in, so now we have update functionality. We can go and update the data. 
included behind the scene stores the data in addition to an index and in addition to a, a, a timeline metadata in terms of at what time what was changed. And on the reader side, you can basically get the latest data or you can give it a timestamp and ask for the records updated since that timestamp. Uh, so the way uh, it affected the, our big data platform was if you look at the, this top graph showing the classic way of processing options. So if you need a database to let you write the data and update it less than one second, the, base, the only solution you have is something like the traditional databases. If you want to have like access to the data, you want to batch process your data, but you are okay with later latency or freshness of one day, usually the solution is batch because it's more efficient. And if you need something between one second and one day, the best option available usually is like a streaming batch and you use like Spark streaming or use uh, Fling or something like that. Uh, with Hoodie, we had something else in between. So again, the, for the pretty fast one second or lower latency, database is the solution. Uh, we push the boundaries between batch and streaming from one day to have something between five minutes. So basically using Hoodie, if you need five minutes freshness of data, you go with traditional streaming. Between five minutes and one day, you can incrementally pull the changes in mini batches uh, and uh, compared to what micro batches that we use in Spark. So basically these mini batches lets you to process the change data using in, in a batch fashion without actually worrying about the accuracy of the data. And that is a fundamental change for our, our platform because uh, in terms of latency, we have something between traditional streaming and batch in terms of completeness, when you're doing streaming, you have limited functionality in terms of, for example, data writing data. You need to have a look back window. You have limited join functionality and you have limited look back window. Batch lets you overcome all this stuff and Hoodie gives you a stream of data in addition to the full batch full join functionality. In terms of cost, it's in the same order of batch jobs. So it's much more efficient than a streaming job that you get the entire record, take one piece of and throw the, the rest out. The batch jobs that we run, we store the data in column of file format and it reads only the part that is needed for by the platform. So it significantly reduces the amount of cost. Uh, so let me see how we're doing on time. Okay. Let me quickly go with this. So Hoodie provides a two view on the same tables. So think about this table. So this is the source tables being written. So initially we had key one, value A, B at time T zero. And then there was an update on that as like basically it become G and H. When these data get ingested into Hadoop, so Hoodie provides two functionality, two ways of viewing this table. One is the basic latest mode, which means okay, given this behavior in Hadoop, give me the latest value. The other one is the incremental one that I mentioned. You give it a timestamp and you ask for it to give you all the changed intermediate values since that timestamp. So it gives you an incremental mode, incremental stream of all these changed values. So depending on the use case, you can use any of these uh, modes that you want. This is how a data platform looks like after we introduce Hoodie. So on the left, we again have all these uh, traditional data sources. Uh, we summarize all these change log that we receive from them. So we don't need snapshot anymore. We get, we, we read the right head logs and use those to update our Hadoop data sets. Uh, so Hoodie gives us update functionality on top of 4K. And so that brought the whole end-to-end -end data latency from 24 hours to less than 30 minutes. Actually, and we're pushing it even to five or 10 minutes right now. So that was a big revolution in terms of how our big data, big data was supporting the business because the data latency, we were able to scale our data set to hundreds of petabytes using HDFS regulation and have a generic ingestion solution. And using Hoodie, we were able to bring our data latency to order of tens of minutes after that 24 hours. Uh, and this is the part that uh, I was mentioning that when you have a source table, you have updates coming on top of that. And you need to think about how you want to, because we have a bunch of these derived tables on top of that. So one thing is how do I update these existing tables in Hadoop? On the other hand, when I have an ETL job here, how do I fetch only the updated data to update my derived data set? And it can be a chain of these derived tables that you need to basically rely on that. Using Hoodie, we can efficiently only pull out the change data and update the next table. So you have both update functionality as well as the functionality to pull out only the change data. And this basically figure shows all our components coming together. So we have all these different sorts of data stores at the, uh, at the left. We 
get all these change log in a standard fashion through Kafka. And this is our ingestion platform, normally, that brings all these data into Hadoop. So the data is stored in Hadoop in codified formats. Uh, to ensure we have high quality data, we build a service like schema service that enforce schema from the source all the way through the ecosystem to make sure only high quality data gets in. Uh, and the users have can pick different query engines to directly interact with the data, or they can use again the memory projects to send these derived data sets out of Hadoop to Cassandra or Cloud or Elastics. So this is how, how our own uh, entire big data platform comes in, uh, comes together. So, okay, so next, uh, uh, what's next? Uh, obviously we are not done there because I'm still working there. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so um, the, one, the main issue that we're still facing and we're working on to, to tackle is the data quality. That's an ongoing battle. So you fix something, the other things start showing up. Uh, so we, we started, uh, so we had a loose contract in terms of what gets stored at the source. We started by inf uh, inferring the schema and enforcing the schema during the ingestion. But what do you do when you get garbage data? Initially, you were throwing it out, but the business relies on this data. You can't keep throwing them out. So we started enforcing schema before the data gets stored in those uh, online transaction databases. For many of these databases that lets you store a JSON blob there, this is a fundamental change to have schema enforced on top of those. The other thing that we started working on is, to, so we started by having a schema service that ensures the structural type checking. Trips, for example, fair should be decimal. You can't put a string there. We started enforcing types similar to programming types uh, on top of our data sets to make we have a correct schema. Then we went one step beyond that. We started enforcing semantic checks. For example, if you have a fair, it shouldn't be a negative value. If you have an age, it should be between a reasonable and average. So we started defining more and more of these semantic checks on top of our types, basic types. <clears throat> we started defining a primitive types like geolocation, currency. There was a big issue in terms of, okay, what you have a numbers for fair, what currency is that? Is that in local currency, is that in US currency? So we started standardizing the definition of currency, geolocation, all those stuff, uh, and have people define their schema using these primitive uh, 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 schema types. Uh, we started to, we used to have Avro schema used all the way into our, in our analytical boards. The online services were relying on uh, protocol and three. So we started converging these two and making sure that the, the way the thrift schemas are defined is compatible with the Avro version of those. Specifically, when these thrift schema gets changed, the Avro compatibility checks is also uh, checked before accepting those changes. Otherwise, you have something that's basically backward compatible in terms of script, in terms of tip or protobuf, not backward compatible in terms of Avro. So we started tackling those problems. The other issue we were facing, so we brought down the data latency for raw data to 30 minutes in our first iterations, uh, but that was still too slow for the business. There was a lot of business use case for breaking it down to five to 10 minutes. That's something we're currently working on. Uh, efficiency is the next big thing, especially when you go public. Uh, before that, reliability and going to business is the number one thing, but then you have to start thinking about the cost of operating these pipelines. You need to start making sure that uh, you, you are getting the best output out of your hardware. So one project we started in that regard was uh, we were having these like boxes that we were using for our, for example, our dispatch. And these are boxes that the peak can uh, differ a lot from the average because everybody takes trips around, like let's say Friday night or Saturday night. The rest of the time, these are not taking, using the, the, all, the, all the hardware available. So we started having a unified research resource scheduler to make sure that uh, basically our jobs are, uh, our hardware is used, utilized in the best possible way, regardless of uh, the, the type of the jobs. We went beyond traditional Mesos or Kubernetes and we built a unified, uh, scheduler, uh, resource scheduler across both the batch jobs, analytical boards, as well as the online resources. Uh, it's a pro it's, by the way, it's an open source project called Peloton. It's getting integrated with Kubernetes, so hopefully you get the best of both worlds very soon. Uh, and finally, uh, hoodies are still being actively developed. Uh, we started with the first iteration to make sure we can absorb updates. We can have the option functionality to incrementally pull out the data, but we, there's a efforts to make sure that efficiency is also increasing. We want to have larger and larger file sizes because that's the part that HDFS is suffering most from. 
and uh, initial on initial versions that we had, the cost of absorbing the updates uh, was pretty high. So we started on how we can reduce those costs over time. That's one project that we are working on. Uh, so I'll start to wrapping up by going over some of our learnings. So uh, these are the summary of like basically some, many of them may be obvious for you, but it's good to remind them to yourself. So uh, one thing I should call out is uh, when we started working on Hoodie projects, we did it because we looked at our, the way our data, the nature of our data sets and how users were relying on this data. And we narrowed it down that, okay, we need the two primitives, update, delete functionality, as well as incremental proof. This was a life saving for us when some regulation like GDPR came up. Many companies that were like in similar domain to us, they, the idea was, okay, we don't care about the cost. We threw all the data in a appendable or immutable file formats and we free laid out the rest of access on the user side. Uh, so the, the data was there, you didn't just don't let the users access those, the internal users. Uh, with GDPR, you cannot store this data. So the data needs to be actually deleted. And this is, has to happen on an ongoing basis, right? So for us, it was relatively straightforward because we had the right primitives to update and delete historical data. Many of those companies were stuck. They could do one-time rewriting of a data, but they have to keep doing it all the time. This is the time that actually we had a huge number of users start using the uh, Woody uh, project because they were stuck with the problem. This is a time that many similar products start showing up, the Databricks Delta or the, uh, the, the Netflix Iceberg. These are the projects similar to these that came up because they was using these across all these companies. The other, uh, layer, so the, the learning out of that is, don't just take a solution and use it. If you start with something before taking, making any changes to that, Spend some time, understand your use cases, your data patterns, and pick a solution that works best based, based, based on that, rather than just picking something because Uber is using it or other companies use it. The other thing, uh, the learning for us is the, the data quality is an ongoing battle. It's, it's never ending. So you need to keep improving on that. You need to invest from that in early days. Otherwise, you're going to end up stuck with a data swap. That's really hard to get out of. For us, luckily, we had good. Uh, uh, shielding against that, we had effective data lakes, and but we still had a lot of issues. For example, uh, semantic check is something you face. We start adding these checks and end up data content. We try to define range, should we find currencies, should we find new stuff. So start thinking about the data, enforcing the schema obviously from day one for sure, and then try to think about the layers above that. Try to have primitive uh, va uh, enumerated values rather than stream. So having a schema and having that users put any string in it, it's an easy way to get this started, but it doesn't get to buy you anything because again, users can dump anything they want as a string. Try to enforce as much uh, data types, as much restriction as you want before users start for the generating this data. Make sure everything is documented. When you have hundreds thousands of these tables, it's super easy to have the schemas but not be able to understand it because again, there is not enough documentation. So that's something you should invest on from day, 10, from day one. Start enforcing like standardization, how the, day, the feeds are defined, how the feed names are defined, how, it's the, how the, code, the types are used, think about the usable data types, start investing in those data quality aspects from day one. Uh, standardize everything as soon as possible. It's really hard, it's really easy to make exception in the early days to let things go but those would always become and hit you sometimes later and it becomes very costly to change those late afterwards. And so try to have standardization and try to avoid uh, making exception. That's the key to scale this data to, to several thousand or several hundred petabytes. You can't live with the exception basically. And retention, that is something that again, most people including us start thinking about afterwards. It's a big change when you start enforcing retention. Uh, it definitely is something required because it saves you dollar amounts. There's regulation in terms of what needs to be deleted. At the same time, it's a big mindset change for the company. You have users, they were assuming that the data is going to be there forever. Now you want to start enforcing. So one suggestion, if you're building a big data platform, have a retention from day one. Even if you want to be generous and set, let's say, one year, two years of retention, whatever makes sense, start making, forcing the user to think about the retention when they're building application relying on this data. Uh, track all the metadata, who generated the data, what's the lineage between these data, what's the data content, what's, who's accessing what data. These are life-saving like data, if metadata, data about your data, 
that helps you basically make decisions afterwards. Invest in a good data pipeline monitoring, refine your terminology, freshness, latency, completeness, late arriving data. Make sure you have standard definition of those and users rely on those. If they need, for example, all the data to be there to run a query to do some business decision, that's very different, for example, for a detection application that only needs 80% of the data. Make sure you have right terminology based on your use case so users can decide when to run the query and how to use it based on their business needs. Minimum your, uh, your platform dependency on user-defined values. A good example is like in early days, we were relying on the value, the timestamp value that users put in the record to partition the data and to make decisions. Again, you can't, when you are having several hundreds of thousands of users generating this data, and you have hundreds of these, thousands of these pipelines, you, you can't rely on users' value. We had a lot of outages because users didn't put the timestamp in the data they generated, or they they, they change the notion of time in, in the way they were putting the data. So we start moving out of those and move, rely on system-based, like basically uh, uh, values, for example. The time standard that data got stored at the online transaction data stores. That's a standard rate. It's a system-based data uh, time stamp. It basically it doesn't get affected because of the user deploying a code for getting to put uh, the time stamp. So. And finally, again, time stamp, I keep mentioning that. Pay attention to the notion of time. There's a big difference in terms of when an event is generated in the physical world, when it got stored in your basic data stores, when it hits your analytical database, and when it gets stored in your big data platform. These makes big decisions. We had a lot of issues when people have misunderstanding about the notion of time, and they make business decisions because they didn't use the time in correct fashion. So start summarizing from day one, and hopefully that saves you a lot of time. Uh, having said that, uh, Obviously, we are growing very fast. We are still investing a lot in infrastructure. So if any of the topics I talked about today is interesting to you, uh, please come and talk to me afterwards or send me a resume. We are, I'm hiring for my team in both Palo Alto and San Francisco. If you want more detailed version of these talks, uh, so there is a link in terms of our Uber's Big Data platform on the left. Uh, that is an extended version of the talk I just gave. Uh, it has more examples. Also, it's a point. It has pointers to all the details. So, if you want, for example, read about Marmara, it has the links to Marmara. If you want to learn about HDFS scalability, it has pointers towards that. So, it has a lot of pointers. So, that's a good point to get started and uh, read more about, like whatever I talked about today, more extended and more examples. And having all said all those, I wrap it up here. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be trying my best to answer. Uh, yeah, so the question is, if we started looking into, uh, if we start using different types of hardware because that gives us different performance. The answer is yes, but I am not involved with that. So uh, we are uh, on the software layer, um, a few layers above our hardware uh, uh, guys. So there are teams who look at the business use case and the performance on the current hardware and decide on the schemes of the hardware for different use cases. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they may have publication of that. I may try to find it for you. I, I know some of this stuff has affected my team and I know we have different variety of hardware. One thing uh, remember is you can't have way too many different type of hardware when you're operating at scale because it becomes the hardware, the maintenance cost very high. You need to pick a few categories, but you definitely need different types of hardware. Yes. Is the normal needed to access the pipeline or is it Can you repeat that? Is memory support all kinds of sources or is memory limited to Kafka? Oh, so the question is, is memory support all different sources? Uh, uh, or only Kafka. We have open source a bunch of sources, including MySQL, I think Kafka, and some others. We are uh, trying our best to open source more. It's pretty relatively straightforward to extend it to a specific data source if you have. Uh, if you have any specific source in mind, let me know. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what exact sources and things we provide. I know we have MySQL, Kafka, and Cassandra, I think, there. 
uh, but we can discuss it if you have any specific source now. And you can help us again. If you may, if you don't have it, we're happy to work with you to have it. So when you do the like the mini batches and like that, and it's not checking say the long row where the there's no fit. So what do you do? Uh, so the question is, uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. What do you mean by error is not good? No, ten thousand rows of that number. The mini batch. You do semantic check, right? So say a row is bad. Mm. Oh, so okay. So the question is if when we start enforcing structural or semantic checks on the incoming data and we notice that row is bad, what do we do with that? So in early days, we started by inferring the schema on the fly, uh, which was not, it was very fragile because if you have uh, some violation of schema compatibility, it breaks. Uh, then we started having predefined schema and bringing in the data using that. We enforce both type checking and semantic checking, and we threw away. As we have, you remember the error tables I mentioned? So we put all the records that are not matching those those schema, we put in the side <coughs> error tables, right? But it was still problematic. It solved the problem that nothing was dropped. You get everything either in the main table or in the side error tables, and then users can use that to back to the source data. The problem was it was an afterthoughts, and for the users who were coding this table, they had it was a lot of a waiting time for the other team to go and fix them. So we started pushing these schema checks to the upstream team. We work with a storage team that they have storage gateways and they do check this stuff on the storage gateway, which means if you have bad data generated, the storage layer basically checked it too. Usually these things happen when you have a new code deployed and that violates this stuff. Uh, because the way the data is produced, we have a client library on both sides too, and they use that to generate this data. But if for any reason they misuse that or generate bad data, the, the first echo that gets tried, they try to store in transactional data stock gets rejected back to them, and they can basically have automatic rollback to the previous code. So the whole batch is rejected? It's not a batch, it's single time. So we are talking about batches afterwards when we get analytical votes. This is like on the online transactional stores that usually you write row by row. The first row that you're trying to write, which is non backward compatible with wireless the schema violation, it gets rejected at the storage. Same for the Kafka, if you're asking about the Kafka source, uh, we have clients that uh, use the schema checks and they have to, the users have, producers have to use those clients to generate the data to Kafka. That checks the schema check and it actually in Avro encodes it and sends it to Kafka. So it doesn't get into Kafka at all. It gets rejected at the source when it's created by the schematics. So we we use uh, for our we, we use the we use yarn in our dashboards, and we have that Peloton project that is our resource scheduler across batch and basically online services. Especially in case of you know before generation to link up so that users can use a lot of chaos to not uh keep things inside so if so so the question if i understand the question shane you are asking about utilization of the cluster or not having enough resources yeah so for the utilization parts uh, we again we have like yarn allows you to have minimum and maximum queue sizes and the maximum is basically is given to you when the other teams are not using your queue so we have a lot of jobs that are not time sensitive and when there's extra resources we let them uh, to make sure the utilization remains high, we actually oversubscribe our clusters by, I think, 30% or 40%. Uh, so they are basically, they're, there's more jobs running all the time compared to resources we have. That, but we have distinction in terms of what is the minimum guaranteed resources you get versus the maximum, which is basically the uh, best effort that is available. Yeah. yeah. Yes, very good question. So the question is right now we have with Hoodie, we have 30 minutes data latency and we are pushing it to five minutes. Actually, we have it rolled out for a few tables at five, 10 minutes. And so is it manageable? By manageable, I mean, that is it cost efficient to, to operate at that scale or not? It is, uh, we, we came up with a different uh, architecture. Uh, So this, so just to summarize the problem, in the first version of Hoodie that we built, we use a technology called copy and write. 
Uh, if you think about it, these parquet data are immutable. Uh, so Kudi gives you an abstraction, a notion of updating it, but behind the scene, he was rewriting the parquet file in a new version of it and update that records. The problem with that is you want to have large files. So let's say you have one gigabyte files and you have worst case, you have one records updated out of that. So the cost, the actual, the right cost of that was pretty high, right amplification, because you were rewriting one gigabyte of file because of one records update. In the second version of Hoodie, we started tackling that for exact same problems. It uses technology called merge and read. Basically, you have a base parquet files, uh, and most of your records, as long as there's no update, goes there. When you get an update on a one record, we don't go and rewrite the whole file because of one record. We start a raw file format next to it, store that updates over the delta files. Uh, so, and then we have an asynchronous compact there that compacts these two into a new parquet file when there's enough updates to justify to amortize the cost. This is, the, this is how we were able to make Hoodie scalable in an efficient way and have larger file sizes. So in terms of the, the, the product version, right? So when you uh, have the, the, on the query side also, uh, you, how do you make sure that you get time yeah. That's a very good question. It's exactly <laughs> this uh, covers. So I, I skipped some of these because I wanted to get the high levels, but that's a very good question. Uh, so basically on the query side, uh, we have one query calls basically a read optimized view, which basically only reads the parquet data, which is efficient in terms of like what you read and the query cost. Uh, so we do that asynchronous compaction based on two criteria. One based on the notion when you have enough updates to justify rewriting the files, or we had a major compaction, let's say every six hours. So on the read optimized view where you only see the, uh, the, the, the parquet data, uh, you would only see the, the, the ones that are compacted. The policy we have is we do more aggressive compaction on recent dates of data. Let's think about our trips. As I said, most of our updates in the past few days, we have some updates from past few months or stuff. The idea is based on the business need that users care most about the, the recent updates and recent dates, and they can wait for a few hours to get an efficient access to a trips that's updated six months ago. So that is on the read optimized view. At the same time, we had a new view called real-time view. This is the view that on the query side, we read both the base parquet files and the delta files and merge them on the query side. It gives five minutes access to all the data, not just the recent data, all the data. The query cost goes higher because if two users query the same data set, you have to merge it twice. So we only provide that for the use cases that justify. They're willing to pay more uh, in terms of the compute for the sake of ratio data. We do structural type checking for all the fields we have in our digital worlds. Semantic is better. It was one of the uh, ongoing efforts that we are currently working on. We are introducing more and more semantic checks right now. Uh, we do not have semantic checks. We do have type and set, uh, structural checking on all fields. Semantic checks, we are defining them as uh, go forward. So the version part, so do you keep all the previous versions of updates in the view? Very good point. So the question is, yes. So the question is, if you look at here, when we have this best parquet file version one, there's an update on version two, version three, version four, right? So, and this is like different snapshots of the data that we store. So the question is how many of these versions we store? So it's a trade-off between how much you want to pay for the storage versus how many versions in the past you want to store. What we guarantee to our users is, we store enough versions to give you all the changes for the past 24 hours. Uh, beyond that, it's basically, so the idea is if you have an ETL job that's pulling this data out, you're running the ETL in an incremental fashion. So as long as you are within 24 hours behind, you can incrementally pull out the changes. If you fall behind, your pipeline is broken for two or three days, the amount of incremental change is so much that it's best for you to do a one-time bootstrapping. That's why we stored enough versions for, to give users incremental full functionality for the past 24 hours. And we basically do a cleanup of the versions beyond that. But it's a, it's a configurable option, so you can make the decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Parquet is immutable, correct. Yeah, but it's append only now. 
No, no, no. So, so if you look at here, so I have listing you about this example. So you get a bunch of data, you write it in, in file one dot part K, we put a dot V1. Now there is updates on one of these records. So in older version, we rewrite the whole files, update that records, and we call it DT. So depending on what timestamp the users give, we can read this snapshot or this snapshot. So that's why I was saying we have transactional different snapshot of the same data set, and we can query each one based on what you in the new version, in the merge on which more efficient, you have the version one, all these new records get stored in an outdoor file format, row file format, and you, again, depending on what read mode you use or when it gets compacted, it gets compacted into new Yeah. In terms of more efficient, so you have a lot of Very, very good question. So the question is, how do we monitor all these several thousands of jobs? So we started by, that's why I was talking about, make sure your monitoring uh, uh, terminology is clear to the whole company. In, all, in early days, we started by monitoring based on something called freshness, which means if you think about, for example, all these data coming to Kafka, for those of you who are familiar with Kafka, you have different partitions. So you find out your data. So let's say 10 events get generated, you find out into five, 10 partitions and then you start it. On the reader side, if one of these partitions is stuck and you start seeing all the other nine, you will see new thieves or new events showing up, but you're missing part of that data. In early days, you are monitoring based on the notion of freshness, which means, okay, what's the latest timestamp I received across all these partitions, all different sources, which only basically gives you an idea if the whole pipeline is blocked or not, right? That was very problematic because one partition gets stuck and some part of it doesn't get blocked. So we started moving towards the notion of completeness and latency. Basically, we, we had them, again, we are reading a right ahead logs from the upstream source. So we, we, no, uh, we standardize on the notion of times and we bucketize data from the source based on the, that's why I was saying that we need to use the same notion of time. So we use the same notion of time, we bucketize how many records are sent to from the source from the right ahead logs to Kafka, all the way to the ingestion. This way we can do completeness monitoring. The advantage of that is we can show a metric saying that you are a user, you're looking, querying a data, you care about the data from this morning 10 to 11. I can show you what's the current completeness of that timestamp compared to what we have at the source. And depending on your use case, you may want to let, wait, for example, a few more hours to make sure it reaches 100%, or you may say, okay, my use case is good with 80% of the data in company. So that's how we do the monitoring these things. And we obviously have different tiers for our monitoring. So we provide, for example, lossless ingestion, we provide three months of ingestion. We have different Kafka plus and different pipelines, depending on the use cases and different tiers. So once you have some simulation, the 3D output format. So is that a conversion between Avro and Avro? No, so we decided, so we needed a file formats a, a row based file format. So we have the columnar file format of RK. We needed a row file format because that lets us append uh, this uh, logs at the end, right? Uh, we use Avro because it works best with, uh, with, with the way the data is encoded and our uh, analytical data source, uh, analytical stack. That's for how we picked on Avro. Uh, and Hadoop in general has good integration with Avro. On our, in our online world, we use both above and three for it. But in, in this part, we, we use the Avro file format. Yes. So I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one relating to you have, um, you mentioned the data team has been decreasing. Uh, can you quantify which sections are decreasing the most? And uh, that's one question. And the second question is relating to uh, how you deal with late arriving data. Uh, that it, and, uh, that's a little bit related also to what you do to the manufacturing itself. That is, are there overlapping windows or there's some discreteness to the manufacturing itself? So uh, the second part, it's easier for me to answer. I didn't get your first question, I'll get back to you. So the first one is like, the second one, if I'm super, you're asking, okay, uh, how do we deal with the late arriving data? And is there any limitation or any look back window in terms of how the data arrives? The answer is no, because right now with Hoodie, we do have the, uh, the functionality to update any data, any trees in the past. Uh, so we can do it six months ago, or one day ago. We have functionality to update the data. So it doesn't matter for the writer ingestion side in terms of how out of band the data is, that's one thing. 
On the reader side, that was the incremental pool functionality I talked about. The users also don't need to again to, uh, don't need to have like traditional ETL jobs. They have a look back window. They look at the past seven days of data to update the derived tables, right? With Hoodie, you don't need to worry about that. You give it a timestamp. I ran my ETL jobs last time you know, this morning. Give me all the records that are updated or new since that time, regardless of what where, what partition it has happened. So even if you have an update on a tweet from six months ago, it gives you a stream of that tweet. Your job can decide, okay, do you care about six months ago tweets or not? You can decide on that based on business logic. Because you're sending the incremental updates as opposed to, <laughs> Yes. So, so, on, so the source of two tables has all the updates. The ETL jobs that you run, it gives you all the updates. Uh, it depends on your business logic. For example, if you are operating San Francisco city and you want to get like an average fair trips for the past one week, you don't care about the free and getting updated from one month ago. Right? That's a business logic in terms of what you want to do. Do you care about that uh, updates from six months ago or not? We, again, there's so many different use cases. Some of them care, some of them don't. Uh, so we can't make a call. What we can do is to make sure they get those and they can decide on whether to drop it or process it based on the logic. I didn't get your first question. Okay. If you want to repeat well, Because the data fee, you've been going from 24 hours to 30 minutes, et cetera. I'm sorry, do you have, have you quantified which areas that you need to increase? The, the, what, what I mean by latency is, uh, so if there's a new tweet happening, let's say at the, in the, in the online, online world, it gets sold in a transactional. We want that new tweet to show up in Hadoop in 30 minutes or five minutes based on the difference of safety, right? That's one thing. On the updates that happen, if a tweet from, let's say, one year ago gets updated right now in our transactional data stores, I still want that to show up in Hadoop in five minutes. So when I said latency, it's latency compared to write ahead logs and the updates or new records at the transactional data source. Yes, sir. Uh, if someone was creating a new pipeline, would you recommend implementing this uh, in the same way that you would recommend creating a new pipeline for the same time and then you can start or is it from hidden complexity and operational? So the question is, if you are starting a building a pipeline from scratch, yeah. should you go with snapshot based or incremental? And obviously, I have no idea about the use cases and the scale you want to operate. Snapshot is what everybody starts with. It's scalable if you have tens of terabytes of data and you have a few of these pipelines. If you get 200 terabytes or 200 terabytes, it becomes very inefficient, depending on the amount of updates. A good example is uh, in terms of our own chief data set, the trips is, I think, right now, 300 terabytes of data. We have around 100 gigabytes of new trips or updates every day. If I go with snapshot base, I'm reconverting 300 terabytes of data over and over every day. That job takes 24 hours, and I have to 2,000 spark executors every day. It's a lot of waste of compute resources and a lot of data. So depending on the scale and how uh, type of data, uh, snapshot is not the, it's the easiest, not the most efficient or the fastest. Yes, yeah, sir. Is there any benefit using Apache Iceberg on the so, uh, so yeah, I have a question a lot. Apache Iceberg, uh, Databricks, Delta, these are all projects developed on the same concepts. We started, again, if you get the history, we started way ahead of them. They didn't exist at the time, otherwise they would have partnered with them and do that. Uh, Iceberg specifically has a different use case. It's mostly for managing the metadata than the actual yeah. data itself. It doesn't have the log. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that is the part that we are trying to see how we can integrate those two together. The Delta is the closest one to this thing. It actually implements a lot of this functionality. Delta is database? Yes, database. Uh, that's a good project. Uh, we had a way a head start ahead of them because of the merge and read and those stuff that we do. We have new stuff coming up next year as well in terms of uh, cross DC consistency and those stuff. Uh, but, so we have a head start on those, but that has a good fundamentals. Too. It just didn't exist at the time we start. Let's thank Reza. It was very okay. good. Thank you.